So chapter 14, we spent a couple weeks so far looking at this chapter. It's probably one of the longest days in the life of the 12 disciples. Uh, it started off that day with Jesus getting word that John the Baptist was beheaded. And he was killed by King Herod Antipas. So when John uh, word comes to Jesus about that, he takes the 12, he says, let's get away, let's go up in the hills, and we're going to have some R&R for basically, you know, just a quiet time together with the Lord. Well, as soon as they get up there, the crowds figure it out, and they quickly descend upon Jesus and the disciples, just multitudes. And we'll see there was like fifteen to 20,000 people will show up. And we're told that Jesus, when he sees them, he was moved with compassion for them. Uh, it says that he healed the sick. He taught the people concerning the things about the kingdom of God. And as the day wore on, the disciples started telling Jesus, hey, it's getting late. Uh, the people are getting hungry. We need to send them away right now so that they can get to some villages and find something to eat. And Jesus, knowing what he's going to do, he says, you give them something to eat. And they're like, well, we don't have enough money to feed any of these people. We can't do that. And finally, Andrew found this young boy who had a, a lunch. You know, he had five little barley loaves and two small fish. And he brings this to Jesus and he says, but what are these among so many? Interesting what's going on in his mind. I don't know. That's all we got. I'll give it to Jesus, see what he can do. And that's one of the lessons we sing, uh, see in all this because Jesus tells him, bring them here to me. And for us, whatever you have, no matter how insignificant you think it is, no matter how worthless you think you might be, God can use you. He can use whatever you bring to him and he can multiply it. He can do above and beyond anything that we could hope or imagine. Jesus tells the disciples, get all the people to get into groups of 50 and hundreds. And so all, you know, just again, 15 to 20,000. We know it's a lot because there's 5,000 men that are fed. And then at the end of that section, it says, plus their, um, the women, plus the children. And so easily 15 to 20,000 people were on this hillside. And it says Jesus takes the bread and the fish. He, you know, blesses it. And he starts to create more and more bread and fish, and it just starts multiplying. And the, the word for baskets or these large, like a laundry basket that they're filling up, and these guys are taking them to all these groups of 50 and 100, probably just dumping it out there, you know, among them, running back to Jesus. He's filling them up as fast as they can get to him. He's taking them back and forth till everybody eats, everybody is full. And it literally means they were gorged. They were stuffed to the max. And then Jesus tells the disciples, go and gather the leftovers. And each one of the 12 disciples came back with their own full basket of bread and fish. So Jesus knew exactly how much to make to fill up everybody and then also to blow the minds of these disciples. You each have your own full basket. And so the Lord is teaching them a valuable lesson through this miracle, especially how Jesus will supply whatever we need, whenever we need it. But then we saw how the multitude, they wanted to take Jesus by force. This is what the Gospel of John says. They wanted to make him king. So we're told here and in Mark's Gospel that Jesus made the disciples get in their fishing boat and he sends them off across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, you know, sneaks up on the hillside and disperses the multitude. And then he just watches because he knows what's going to happen next. The disciples are being obedient. They go across the sea, and about halfway out there, they get this big storm hitting them, and they end up stuck there for about seven or eight hours, because it was just around sunset when they take off, and Jesus will walk on water to them around four or five in the morning. It was the fourth watch which means it was like four or five in the morning. Jesus will come to them. And so they've been working, rowing for seven or eight hours. They're exhausted. And when Jesus walks out to them, it says they're just shocked. They're like, it's a ghost. And he says, no, 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 it's I, or I am, ego eme, don't be afraid. And so Peter's the one who says, Lord, if it's you, command that I come to you on the water. And so Jesus says, come. And Peter literally gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. We don't know how far he walked, but he was walking close enough to Jesus to where 
He starts looking at the storm. He starts freaking out and he starts to sink. He says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches down and he picks him up. And then they get into the boat and Jesus simply says, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? In other words, Peter, you're doing so good, but you got your eyes off of me. You know, you need to keep your eyes on me. And so when they get in the boat, we're told the storm cease. The disciples say, truly, you're the son of God. And they worshiped him. Again, Jesus is God, the son, worthy of our worship. If he's not God, then they would be committing idolatry by worshiping Jesus. And so they worship him. And then it says instantly in, uh, I think it's Mark's gospel, they're, they're on the shore. They're there by Capernaum the next day. It's like, again, four or five that next morning. So a long day for the disciples. So we pick up at the end of chapter 14, starting in verse 34. And we'll go quickly through this. It says, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of the Garis, uh, Gennesaret, and when the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. And so again, word quickly spreads throughout the surrounding region that Jesus is back and apparently the people had heard the story of the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years. Remember we saw that earlier where she says in her, you know, to herself, if I could only touch the hem of his garment, I know I could be healed. And, and so she does and she's healed and Jesus calls her out because he wanted her to come forward and testify of what happened. And so word probably spread about her. And so now everybody's just wanting to touch the hem of his garment. Even if we just touch his garment, we'll be healed. And it says, all who did were made perfectly well. That literally means they were made completely whole. So Jesus is blowing people's minds. This was incredible. This was real. This, there was no gimmicks. There was no hype. It was just Jesus being Jesus. You know, He was doing what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it, proving that he was the promised Messiah. So now the scene shifts as we come into chapter 15 because word comes out to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, what Jesus is doing, and they go up to him, and they're going to be upset, and they're going to complain. And that's usually what happens with religious people. You know, they don't like the freedom, the joy that we have in Jesus and when people are religious, they get legalistic, and then they get jealous of the freedom we have, the joy in Christ we have. And so these guys will come to Jesus. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, now pause there a moment, because once again, the scribes and Pharisees started off really good. You know, it was after the Babylonian captivity, after 70 years, they go to Jerusalem, they rebuild the temple, the scribes and Pharisees, were really on fire for the Lord. They wanted to protect God's word. They were zealous for God's word. The scribes were the ones who copied the scriptures down, and they made sure it was accurate. And it started great. But by this time, 450, 500 years later, when Jesus is on the scene, these guys have become very, very legalistic. And uh, their approach to God was based on their own actions. They're, they're way they came to God. It wasn't a relationship. It was very religious. And all these rituals and regulations they started to impose upon the people at this point. So they asked Jesus a question. Look at verse 2. They say, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread couple of things to take note of here. First of all, when they asked Jesus, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? It's really a stupid question because you can't sin or transgress against man's traditions. You can sin against God's word. You can sin against God's commands, but you can't sin against man's traditions. And Jesus will point this out to them in a moment, but this shows us how they had elevated their own traditions to be equal to or above God's word. These guys are upset with Jesus because they're accusing all the disciples of not washing their hands before they ate this big meal that Jesus provided for them. Again, he just fed the multitudes 
and they hear about the miracle, they're probably thinking, wow, we got to go examine this. And so they start asking around, did you guys do the ceremonial hand washing? I mean, they're not even concerned about or blown away by the fact Jesus just fed them with a little lunchable. You know, they're always concerned about, okay, and so they had a ritual. You'd put your hands like this, they'd pour water over your fingers. And then you'd flip them over, they'd pour water over your fingers. And they wanted Jesus to do this to all 20,000 people so they would be ceremonially clean. And that's what they're grumbling and complaining about here. This had nothing to do with dirty hands, but they came up with this you know, elaborate ritual just to satisfy themselves. And they looked at this as a measuring stick or a measuring rod, a standard for holiness and righteousness. The law talks about a person being defiled if they touched a dead carcass or something like that, but not by how you wash your hands. And so that's what these guys are doing. They're setting up this standard, how righteous or unrighteous you are. And they're thinking, you guys are doing all these things wrong. You're unholy. You're unrighteous, Jesus, because you didn't do this ceremonial cleansing. This was not God's measuring rod, by the way. We're declared righteous only by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Period. When you give your life to the Lord, you put your faith and trust in Him, and you receive Him as your Lord and Savior, He declares you righteous. He's not looking under your fingernails. Well, how clean are those fingernails? I mean, He doesn't care about that, and we'll see that again in a moment. So check out Jesus' response to their accusation here. He's going to answer their question by asking them a question, which is a very Jewish thing to do. You know, they used to say if you get two Jewish people together, you'll end up with three questions. And so that's true. But Jesus, verse 3, he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Now, that's a heavy duty accusation that he brings against these religious leaders. You guys are accusing me of you know, transgressing your man-made traditions. Why are you breaking God's law, His commandments, His word? Again, their traditions took precedence over God's word in many situations. And, and unfortunately, there's a lot of that that still happens in churches today. A lot of churches will place their doctrines, not God's word, but their doctrines, their rituals over the word of God. They'll put their opinions, they'll put their false teachings above the Word of God. For example, some churches will teach, you're not really saved unless you've been baptized in water. And then there's a church, a denomination, they'll go so far as to say, well, you're not saved unless you're baptized in water, and it has to be by our pastors in our denomination or you're not saved. What does Jesus say about that? Well, he saved the thief on the cross. What did the thief say? He couldn't get down and get baptized. He said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So this is what Jesus says to him. Luke 23, verse 43. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It had nothing to do with baptism. It had to do with faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism is good. It's an ordinance that we have. Like communion is an ordinance. He only gave us two ordinances baptism and communion, we do these things because we are saved, not to get saved or being part of our salvation. No, we do these things. We do anything good for God because we are saved, not to enhance our salvation or earn something from the Lord, not at all. It's faith alone in Christ alone that saves a person. Paul says this in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The gospel of Christ is the power of salvation. And it simply refers to the fact that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for your sins, for my sins. He was sacrificed in our place. He was the substitute for our sins. He paid the price we could never pay. And again, it was his perfect spotless blood that was the only acceptable payment for our sins. But after three days, Jesus was in that tomb. And after three days, he came back to life. He rose from the dead. And it's only because he's alive today that he can offer somebody the free gift of eternal life. If he stayed dead and buried and didn't rise up, then Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 15 that we are of all people most to be pitied. 
In other words, we're without hope. Might as well just go hang out and play because if Jesus didn't rise up from the dead, then there is no hope of life after death. But because he did, whoever comes to him by faith alone, he will give you eternal life because he's the author of life. We hold fast to verses like this. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Again, salvation is a free gift from Jesus to us, and there is absolutely nothing we can do to merit or earn, and we certainly don't deserve God's salvation. So we need to be careful to not add anything like traditions of men to the gospel message. Some churches will say, well, you, you're saved when you're baptized as a baby. And some of you, I know many of you grew up in a denomination, a church that practiced that. You get baptized as a baby. I've run into so many ex-Catholics, you know, they said, I didn't know anything about Jesus. I had no idea. But they, they try to say, well, you're saved. You're good with God because you were baptized as a baby. And they have no idea who Jesus is. They don't know what the Lord has done for them. They think he's still stuck on a cross somewhere. So sad. Some will say, well, I'm saved because I'm a member in good standing. My name is written in this church membership book. You know what? That means diddly squat. Our name must be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If it's not in the Lamb's Book of Life, it doesn't matter where your name is written, what church denomination you're part of. Others may say, well, you're only saved if you speak in tongues. Well, not according to Paul. He says, not all speak with tongues. So that's not the measuring rod either. Again, there's a thousand different things people can try and add to the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. I love what Paul says here. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians 1. 17 and 18. This should solidify it as far as baptism and regeneration and all that. For Christ did not send me to baptize, this is the Apostle Paul, but to preach the gospel. So, you know, look at that. He didn't send me to baptize. If baptism was part of the gospel, then he wouldn't have said this. He didn't send me to baptize. No, he sent me to preach the gospel. And then he goes on to say, I didn't baptize hardly any of you guys. A couple of you. Gaius and Stephanus, but the rest, I, that's why, not why I came. I didn't come to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And when you really think about it, man's traditions are death when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Traditions often cause people to go through the motions of Christianity, and we look religious, but they cannot draw our hearts closer to the Lord. This is why Jesus says things like John chapter 4, verse 24, where he says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It's not through burning candles or incense. It's not through looking through stained glass images of Jesus. It's not through playing in a sandbox. Some of you know what I'm talking about, where you draw your sins in the sand and then you picture, visualize Jesus wiping it away. No, you're saved. Your sins are washed away because of faith in Christ, not because of some sandbox or litter box. <laughs> Might as well be. No, it's not through washing our hands a certain way, but it's simply coming to Christ by that simple faith that He has given us and receiving all that He has for us by faith and how wonderful it is to know that Jesus loves us. He's living in us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. And so watch how Jesus gives us an example of what these Pharisees were doing concerning their traditions. Again, verse 3 he says, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Verse 4 says, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. I wonder how many of you parents have that over your child's bed. <laughs> Probably not many, hopefully. Verse 5, but you say, whoever says to his father or mother... So this is, what, this is a tradition that the Pharisees came up with. Whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. 
then he need not honor his father or mother. Jesus says, thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. So here Jesus uses the fifth commandment, you know, honor your father and your mother, as an example of how the Pharisees changed God's word and inserted their own traditions and ideas. Honor your father and mother. Again, the fifth commandment. God's point is they took care of you when you were young, when you were frail, when you couldn't, you know, do anything for yourself. You were weak and vulnerable. Now, honor them. They're weak. They're vulnerable. They can't take care of themselves. Take care of your parents. I know that's hard for a lot of people because some of us had abusive parents. Some of us had alcoholic parents. But what a great testimony it is when we can show the love of Jesus to our mom, to our dad, when they are no longer a threat to us, but they're in that vulnerable state. Um, you know, Elizabeth was blessed to be able to take care of her mom for two years, and then um, the last three months of her life, when she, you know, she had Alzheimer's, she stayed with us until she went home to be with the Lord, and my mom stayed with us for about a year. And, you know, you do what you can do, but be that as it may, the Pharisees here, they came up with their own loophole to get out of caring for your frail parents. They told the people, just tell your parents, sorry, mom and dad, we have dedicated all of our extra money to the temple. So we give all of our extra money to these Pharisees and they're going to take care of the temple. So I'm sorry, you're out of the picture. There's a lot of that going on today. Some of these televangelists, they'll say, hey, write us as number one in your will. There's a lot of groups that do these type of things. But tell your parents you can't help them because you're giving your money to take care of the temple. They bypass God's clear teaching by coming up with a new man-made tradition. But Jesus knew they were full of covetousness. He knew their greed. He knew that they were just hucksters and they were substituting the word of God with their tradition. So look what he calls them, verse 7, hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. Notice Jesus calls them hypocrites. Twenty-one times Jesus calls the Pharisees hypocrites. We've seen this before. Hupokrites, the Greek word, simply means one who wears a mask. Their Pharisees are wearing a mask. It's what an actor would do. They would put on different masks. You've seen the images of the mask they'd put on. That would be their character. So that's the Pharisees. They're just playing a part. They're acting righteous. They're acting holy. But Jesus says their hearts are far from the Lord. And so he uses Isaiah 29 to point this out. In our vernacular, we would say they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. You know, their lips say all the right things, but their hearts are far away from God. God is always most concerned about our hearts. When He has our hearts, He has everything. You know, He leads us, He guides us, He strengthens us, but He works within our hearts and our minds, but the seat there is our hearts. He doesn't want us just going through the motions of worship. He wants us to worship Him and honor Him and praise Him. One of the greatest threats to the church today is dead orthodoxy. Think about that, dead orthodoxy. In other words, it's when a church becomes so right, it becomes dead right. They get so concerned about their theology, their doctrine, which is very important, but become, that becomes their main issue rather than our doctrine and theology giving us a closer relationship with Jesus. Jesus wants us to have a relationship with Him. You know, it comes through knowing Him, doctrinally, theology, but that's not the end all. That doctrine should draw us closer to the Lord. Otherwise, it becomes dead orthodoxy. It's when we lose our intimacy with Jesus. It's when we resort to the plans of man and we stop walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's when God's Word gets turned into a bunch of rules, rituals, and regulations instead of being the living, breathing Word of God. Um, a sad but clear example of this is found with the church of Ephesus in the Bible. The church of Ephesus was amazing. You can read about its founding. It's in uh, Acts 19 and 20. 
the great orator Apollos. He started the church in Ephesus. The Apostle Paul then became the main leader of the church in Ephesus. He spent three years there building them up in the faith. He brought in Aquila and Priscilla, two godly people, this married couple, to help you know, get this church rooted and grounded in the Lord. We're told later on that Timothy became the pastor of Ephesus. Talk about great church leadership. I mean, uh, unbelievable. Tradition says, or history says, we don't know biblically, but the Apostle John, we're told, was he spent his last two years when he's almost 100 years old in Ephesus. But before he went to Ephesus, when he's 99, 100 years old, he was on the island of Patmos. Think about that for a moment, because Jesus will give him a letter to write down to Ephesus. Many people, though, got saved through the outreach there in Ephesus. In Acts 19, verse 10, it says, All who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus. And again, it came from this powerful church. The people turned from idols. They trusted in Christ alone for salvation. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, it's considered one of the pinnacles of the New Testament. It's one of the most amazing books where you're taken up into the heavenlies with the Lord, seated at the right hand with the Lord in glory. It's glorious. In Acts 20, we read the Apostle Paul meeting one last time with the elders of Ephesus, and he gives them uh, many warnings about false prophets, false teachings. He tells them to be on guard. Uh, these people will come in like wolves in sheep's clothing. And notice, look at these verses in Acts 20, verses 27 to 31. And this is what the Apostle Paul tells them. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, God's blood, that's Jesus. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Again, amazing, powerful church. And then you move ahead about 40 years after Paul meets with these elders. About 40 years later, Jesus writes them a letter. Do you know Jesus wrote letters? They're recorded for us in the book of Revelation. He wrote seven letters. First one he writes is to the church of Ephesus. So you go about 40 years from when Paul warned them. And Jesus starts off his letter commending them. You guys are hanging in there. You're doing great work. You are able to spot a false apostle and, and know what false teachings are. You guys are doing awesome. You know, watching out for the flock. They're doing all these right things. But then comes these shocking words from Jesus to those in the church of Ephesus. Look at these verses, uh, Revelation 2, verses 4 and 5. Jesus tells the church of Ephesus, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That's exactly what happens when people drift away from their close, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus, and they just get caught up in all the motions of being a Christian. Listen closely. Jesus loves you. He's done everything for your salvation. He did not save you because He needed more people to work for Him. He saved you because He loves you. He saved you so you can spend eternity with Him in glory. He saved you because He wants you to grow in that love relationship with Him. 1 John 4.19 says we love Him because He first loved us. And it was the love of Jesus that drew us to Him in the first place. And that's what He's saying. Return to your first love. You've left your first love. That's that intimacy with the Lord. When you first got saved, you were just like goo-goo for Jesus. You're just like, oh, I can't wait to get home and open the Bible. When I got saved, man, every time <laughs> I get home and I just had to go through the Word. I was at San Diego State and I hated school. 
but I loved the Word of God. And I just I had my whole, I still got my original Bible. My mom, who was an unbeliever, bought it for me. It's crazy. But I still have it in my office. It's all torn up. It's all falling apart. But it's got so many underlined, you know, marked through it. I mean, I couldn't get enough of God's Word. But it was a relationship with Jesus. It wasn't just getting head knowledge. It was just, I can't believe you'd love a sinner like me, that you would save a wretch like me. And I was doing all these horrible things against the Lord. And yet he loved me and he called me to be his own. And it's his love for us that will usher us into glory. And it's his love for us and our love for him that should motivate us to continue to serve him with joy and gratitude, with thanksgiving. But when we leave that first love relationship with Jesus, it's usually very slow. It's very unintentional. We started out on fire for the Lord, but after a while we can start letting other things, even good things, creep into our lives. It causes the fire to go down. You know, it might be just smoldering. Remember when Jesus says a bruised reed he won't break, smoldering flax he won't quench, a smoking flax? Does that mean, it means he's not going to go and put out the little smoke that's coming from that little you know, oil lamp. No, the picture is he's going to breathe on it and cause it to burst back into flame. That's what he wants to do in our lives. We often see this in our marriages as well. Oh, we still love our spouse, but the intimacy, the passion can slowly fade away. But in both cases, the solution is the same. Jesus says, remember where you've fallen, repent, and then do the first works. Repeat. Get back on track with the Lord with an uncompromising heart. We need to start praising Him, thanking Him for saving us, just pouring out our hearts to Him. Talk to Him about everything you're going through in your life, in your marriage, with your family, your job, the people you work with. Talk to Him about those things. So often as we grow and mature in the Lord, we wrongly start to believe that, you know, God's too busy for us and He's got too many big things in the world to take care of. Can you imagine trying to watch out what's going on in Washington, D.C.? Surely He doesn't have time for my problems. No, that's, that's wrong to think that way. He cares about all the little stuff and the big stuff in our life. He loves us. He only wants us to bring everything to Him. He just wants to hear from us. That first love relationship is that simple, childlike faith and trust in the Lord. But oftentimes, the more we grow and mature as a believer, so often our intellect can get in the way. And this is where dead orthodoxy can become an issue. For example, when I got saved, I didn't know anything. What's omniscience? What's you know omnipresence? What's omnipotence? I mean, I didn't know those things. I just knew Jesus loved me. And he wanted me to talk to him. He wanted me to just draw near to him. But then you grow him and you, oh yeah, I know he's omniscient. He knows everything about everything. He knows everything about me. So why even bring all these things to him? Because he already knows. You know, we can become too intellectual to where we stop trusting him. Listen, those things should never cause us to shy away from God. Yes, we're to grow, we're to mature, but those things should never cause us to assume things about God Assume what he's probably going to do in any given situation. Because when I start thinking that way, I'm actually placing my thoughts, my ideas above his or equal to his. And that's not a good thing to do. Come to him like a simple child and look at him as Abba, Father, as Paul says. Papa, Daddy. His ways are so much glorious, so much higher than our ways. But when we... Stop trusting. When we just start thinking or, or assuming, well, I think God would probably do this, so I'll just do it. That quenches the Holy Spirit. That really grieves the Holy Spirit. And we start leaning on our own understanding about the things going on in our lives rather than leaning on the Lord and listening to the Lord, listening to His Word. And this is what we're warned about throughout Scripture. Don't lean on your own understanding. Remember Philippi or, um, Proverbs 3. Verses 5 and 6. Look at these verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Not just part of your ways, but in all your ways. Acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Ephesians 3 verses 20 and 21 says, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. 
It's like, I can't even comprehend that. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And so we assume, okay, you can think all these things about me and I don't care. I'm just going to do my own thing. And if I need you, Lord, I'll call on you because you're pretty big. No, that's not what he wants. He can do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Again, God's thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. Look at this verse in Isaiah 55, 9. We know this verse. It says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, he knows, but he cares, and he wants to work. He wants to answer. He wants to speak into our lives through his word. Be careful. Don't become like these Pharisees. They were great at honoring God with their lips, but their hearts were far from the Lord. And we need to remember this as we sing, as we worship the Lord. <laughs> My mind is so prone to just woo, drift off where we're worshiping. You, know, you can be sitting there, oh, Lord, thank you. You're so good. I hope the Broncos hire a good coach this year. <laughs> you know, I mean, we get so caught up in things. Oh, I hope we can get Aaron Rodgers. That'd be good. Oh. I wonder how the snow at Powderhorn's doing right now. Oh, I want this gal, this guy to think I'm really spiritual. Look at me waving my hands. I mean, all kinds of stuff that gets in the way. It's like, no, focus on the Lord. Keep bringing every thought into captivity to obedience of Christ. Look at verse 10. When he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. In other words, a person is not defiled spiritually by what you eat or don't eat. Eating with clean or dirty hands does not make you holy or unholy or more righteous or less righteous, but it's what comes out of our heart, what comes out of our mouth, it's in your heart, that's what will defile people. That defiles us, it'll defile others. I heard one pastor say it like this, we can taste what goes into our mouth, but we can't taste what's coming out. But sadly, someone else will taste the words that come out of our mouth, Hopefully, it will be seasoned with salt and grace. Good point. Look at verse 12. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know <laughs> that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Don't you realize that the Pharisees are really offended by what you just said, Lord? But that's what the Pharisees wanted. They were trying to get Jesus trapped. They were always saying things to try to put him in a you know, pickle or you know, put him in a corner where he'd have to defend himself and all these other things. Listen, our media did not start fake news. Pharisees were always into fake news, but fake news started in the Garden of Eden when the enemy, the serpent, came to Eve. Did God really say? That's where fake news started. Just grown from there. Did God really say that? It doesn't matter to these Pharisees that Jesus just fed fifteen to 20,000 people or that he healed everyone who came to him. Our problem with you, Jesus, is you don't wash your hands. It's like, what? That is so stupid. How crazy are these people? Verse 13, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? The father sows the wheat, but then the enemy came and he sows the tares, the weeds. So every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. We need to do that with a lot of news channels, a lot of politicians. Let them alone. Don't get all caught up in what they're saying and doing. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. In other words, let the naysayers, the doubters, the wicked people, they're going to always be around. Let them do what they're going to do. Let them alone. But don't worry about them. Don't get all caught up in their drama. God will judge them in the end. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. This world will fall into the pit, but we have the Savior. He's going to lead us to... Well, he's our good shepherd. He leads us to the still waters, the green pastures. So we don't have to get all caught up in all the drama of these guys, these people out there. Verse 15, Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, 
Are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Is that clear to everybody? I don't need to go into details about that, right? Okay. Pretty simple. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, so all these sexual sins, thefts, smash and grab, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So obviously Jesus is talking about food. Eating an apple or eating a Big Mac doesn't defile you or make you holy. Eating yogurt and granola doesn't make you more righteous. Eating pizza doesn't make you less righteous. Eating a Big Mac might make you sick. Oh, sorry. Um, now, if we get in and out here soon, that'll make you holy and righteous. <laughs> you know what I mean. On the bottom of the cup, it's got John 3.16 under there. On their fries, it's got Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 on there. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I hope we get it in and out, but it won't make you holy or righteous or unholy or unrighteous. It's what we allow into our hearts. That's what Jesus is saying. That is what is most important. Jesus didn't come here to tell us how to wash our hands and have clean hands. He came to cleanse our hearts of all sin. He came to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we need to guard our hearts from the wicked, sinful stuff that tries to hinder our close, intimate relationship with Jesus. That's the bottom line. It should always come from a heart that He fills up overflowing with love. Love is the beginning. Love is the end. God is love. Do we love the Lord with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength? I know there's always a lot more room to grow in that love relationship with Him. We got time. So turn with me real quick to Colossians chapter 3. It's not... Um, on the screen, but let's look at a few verses here in Colossians 3. I'll end with this. This is always my go-to section of Scripture as far as keeping priorities straight and keeping our focus on the Lord. Make sure we keep our eyes looking to Him. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1, says, If then you were raised with Christ, so now you're born again, you're a new creation in Christ, Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, in other words, you were crucified with Christ, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you, will, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members, your physical body parts, which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, not upon the bride of Christ, but those who are in rebellion against God, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Verse 8, but now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And here's the key, have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So we're to set our minds on things above, get into the word of God. Then he starts to transform your thinking. He transforms your mind through the word of God. And then you start to see who he really is and how awesome God is. And then he says, where in Christ, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian. That describes some of us, I guess. Scythian, slave, or nor free, but Christ is all and in all. That's kind of like Galatians 3.28. In Christ there's neither Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. We're all one in Christ, so there is no racism in Jesus. He's done away with it in Christ. We're all created in His image and likeness. Therefore, verse 12, 
is the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on. So we're putting off all this junk, and this is what we put on. Tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ, that's what we're spending time in God's word, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him.